the nervous system is divided into two anatomical divisions. The central nervous system, which is composed of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which includes neurons located outside the brain and spinal cord, that is, any nerves that enter or leave the CNS. The peripheral nervous system is subdivided into the efferent and afferent divisions. The afferent neurons bring information from the periphery to the CNS. And the efferent neurons carry signals away from the brain and spinal cord to the peripheral tissues. The efferent portion of the peripheral nervous system is further divided into two major functional subdivisions, the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic efferent neurons are involved in the voluntary controlled functions such as contraction of the skeletal muscles. Somatic nerves are not interrupted by ganglia. And their neurons are myelinated. That takes us to some terms you should know. The neuron or the nerve cell, is the building block of the nervous system, there is a video down in the description will give you a brief intro about it. Synapse, is the junction between two neurons, in this case it is called a ganglion. Or it may be located between the neuron and the effector organ. Preganglionic neuron, is the neuron which its cell body is embedded in CNS and ends at the ganglion. And postganglionic neuron, its cell body originates at the ganglion and ends at the effector organ. Ok let's continue. The second division of the efferent portion of the peripheral nervous system is the autonomic nervous system or ANS. It is responsible for all the involuntary functions that occur unconsciously. It is composed of efferent neurons that innervate smooth muscle of the viscera. Cardiac muscle, vasculature, and the exocrine glands. So it controls digestion. Cardiac output, blood flow, and glandular secretions. Anatomically it is interrupted by ganglia, and the postganglionic fibers are usually not myelinated. The efferent ANS is divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems, as well as the enteric nervous system. Anatomically, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic neurons originate in the CNS and emerge from two different spinal cord regions. The preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic system come from the thoracic and lumbar regions. And the parasympathetic preganglionic fibers arise from cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, as well as from the sacral region, S2 to S4, of the spinal cord. The preganglionic neuron in the sympathetic division is short compared to the postganglionic one. In most cases, the preganglionic nerve endings of the sympathetic nervous system are highly branched, enabling one preganglionic neuron to interact with many postganglionic neurons, so giving generalized effect. While in the parasympathetic division the opposite is found. Sympathetic and parasympathetic actions often oppose each other. If we simplified that I would say parasympathetic is turned on during rest and digest. And sympathetic is turned on in emergencies which is known as, fight, flight and fright conditions. We'll talk about that in details in the upcoming lessons. And the final division of the autonomic nervous system is the enteric neurons. It is a collection of nerve fibers that innervate the gastrointestinal tract pancreas, and gallbladder. This system functions independently of the CNS. It is modulated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. It controls the motility. Exocrine and endocrine secretions, 
and microcirculation of the GI tract. In this lesson we'll discuss the actions of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. But first there are some basic information you should know. Most organs are innervated by both divisions of ANS, sympathetic and parasympathetic. They work in harmony together keeping homeostatic balance by their opposite actions on the body. And this is called dual innervation. Despite this dual innervation, one system usually predominates in controlling the activity of a given organ. For example, in the heart, the parasympathetic division is the predominant factor for controlling rate. There are some organs receiving only sympathetic innervation such as, the adrenal medulla, kidney, pilomotor muscles, and sweat glands. Centers in brain such as, hypothalamus, medulla oblongata, and also the spinal cord. Respond to the stimuli of the afferent impulse, originating in the viscera and other autonomically innervated structures, by sending out efferent reflex impulses via the ANS. And now let's discuss the actions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in a simple way. In the previous lesson we knew that parasympathetic works in resting state and sympathetic works in stressful conditions that we call, fight, fright and flight conditions. To simplify their actions let's start by the sympathetic division. Suppose you are in a fight, I want you to think with me and answer these questions. What exactly do you need from your body in this case? Do you need your GIT or your urinary bladder to be stimulated? The answer is no. So now we know that GIT motility and blood flow decrease and the sphincters of the stomach get contracted. And the saliva secretion becomes little and viscous. And also urine retention happens through the contraction of sphincter muscle and relaxation of detrezor muscle in the urinary bladder. What you really need in a fight or a stressful condition is the strength and energy. So how does your body handles this? Heart rate and force of contraction increase and also blood pressure increase through the contraction of the blood vessels. Lungs also helps you to breath more and get more oxygen through bronchodilatation. Your liver helps you to get more glucose and energy through glycogenolysis. And of course the blood flow to your skeletal muscles increase through the vasodilatation of skeletal muscle blood vessels, and also glycogenolysis increases. Also eye pupil gets dilated, which is known as midriasis. So, these are the actions of the sympathetic nervous system, when you want to remember them remember the fight and what you need and what you don't need. Now let's discuss the actions of the parasympathetic division. Do you remember the homeostatic balance from the beginning of this lesson? Okay. There is a balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic actions. When one goes up the other goes down, and when one goes down the other goes up. Parasympathetic division predominates in resting conditions. We call it rest and digest conditions. Suppose you are sitting on the table and eating. Again, think about what you need and what you don't need from your body. Of course you really need your GIT to work more. So, the motility and blood flow increase and the sphincters of the stomach relax allowing the food to pass through. What else we get are, the stimulation of peristalsis which is the contraction of the GIT and also watery saliva and all of these actions help in the process of digestion. And regarding urination, in resting state your body helps you to get rid of its waste through urine evacuation. Relaxation of sphincter muscle and contraction of detrezor muscle. Heart rate and contraction decrease. Blood pressure decrease. Bronchoconstriction in the lungs. And eye pupil gets constricted, which is known as meiosis. I think now you get it. The parasympathetic actions completely oppose the sympathetic actions. Autonomic receptors are divided into two main categories, the cholinergic receptors, that are activated by acetylcholine, and adrenergic receptors, that are activated by adrenaline and noradrenaline. 
Cholinergic receptors are divided to nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. Let's illustrate this and make it more simple. From the previous lectures we already know these divisions. Now let's discuss the receptors and neurotransmitters locations. Nicotinic receptors are further subdivided to nicotinic neuronal, or NN receptors, that are located in the autonomic ganglia and adrenal medulla. And nicotinic muscular, or NM receptors, that are located in the neuromuscular junction at the skeletal muscles. Muscarinic receptors are located at the synapse of all the parasympathetic neurons in the effector organ. Adrenergic receptors are located at the synapse of all the sympathetic neurons in the effector organ. And there is an exception, muscarinic receptors are located in one place at the sympathetic neurons, the synapse of the sweat glands. So, now we know that acetylcholine exists at all ganglia, somatic nerve endings, parasympathetic nerve endings, sympathetic nerve endings innervating sweat glands. And noradrenaline exists at the nerve ending of sympathetic neurons, and is excreted along with adrenaline from the adrenal medulla direct to the blood. Let's briefly discuss where they are located in the body and their actions. Muscarinic receptors are subdivided to multiple receptors, but only M1, 2 and 3 receptors have been functionally characterized. M1 is located in the parietal cells in the stomach, when activated it increases the production of HCL. M2 is located in the heart, when activated it decreases the heart rate, known as bradycardia or negative chronotropic effect, and decreases the force of contraction, known as negative inotropic effect. M3 is located in lungs, responsible for bronchoconstriction and increases mucus secretion. And NGIT smooth muscles, increases the tone and motility. And in detrezor muscle in the urinary bladder, responsible for the contraction of detrezor muscle causing urine evacuation. And in the eye, it is located in circular muscles, responsible for contraction causing meiosis. And in ciliary muscles, responsible for lens accommodation to near vision. And also M3 receptors in the eye are responsible for the reduction of intraocular pressure. M3 are also located in exocrine glands such as salivary, gastric, lacrimal and sweat glands and they are responsible for increasing their secretions. Stimulation of M3 receptors in endothelial cells of blood vessels causes the release of nitric oxide or EDRF, endothelial-derived relaxing factor, and that activates guanylcyclase, releasing CGMP and finally causing vasodilatation. Adrenergic receptors are divided according to their type to alpha and beta receptors, and according to their position to presynaptic and postsynaptic receptors. The presynaptic receptors are, alpha-2, that when activated inhibits the release of noradrenaline, and beta, that when activated stimulates the release of noradrenaline. The postsynaptic receptors are, alpha-1, beta-1, 2 and 3. Alpha-1 is located in the sphincter muscles of the stomach, causing contraction. And in the sphincter muscles of the urinary bladder, causing contraction and urine retention. And in the blood vessels, causing contraction, increasing the blood pressure. And also in the eye, located in radial muscles, responsible for contraction causing midriasis. Beta-1 is located in the heart, when activated it increases the heart rate, known as tachycardia or positive chronotropic effect, and increases the force of contraction, known as positive inotropic effect and in juxtaglomerular apparatus in the kidneys, releases renin and increasing blood pressure. Beta-2 is located in lungs, responsible for bronchodilatation, and in skeletal muscle blood vessels, causing vasodilatation, and in liver, causes glycogenolysis, so increases glucose in blood, and in GIT smooth muscles, decreases tone and motility. Beta-3 receptors are involved in lipolysis and also have effects on the detrezor muscle of the bladder. So, as we discussed before, there is a balance between the actions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The nerve impulses or action potential move through the nerve, as waves of depolarization till reaching the nerve terminal. This neuron is called presynaptic neuron. 
Thin influx of calcium ions occurs at the nerve terminal, allowing vesicles containing neurotransmitters to adhere to the synaptic membrane and release neurotransmitters by exocytosis. We should notice that there is no direct contact between the nerve terminal and the effector organ. So, connection between them is done by chemical neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter binds to its specific receptor on the effector organ. This leads to changes in the permeability of cell membrane of the effector organs, that leads to initiation of a response in the effector organ. Then comes the last step, which is the termination of the neurotransmitter response. That can be done by two mechanisms, the first one is enzymatic destruction of the neurotransmitter as synapse. And the second mechanism is the reuptake of transmitter by specific transporters at nerve terminal to be stored and reused.